for the Menlo Oaks Road Standards Project. So with me tonight, I have Ann Stillman, the Director of Public Works, Wensi Ng, the Senior Civil Engineer working on the project, and John Shabowski, the Associate Engineer on the project. So before I start, I wanna go over the meeting procedures tonight so that we can have an informative and productive meeting. First thing is that we're gonna be recording the meeting and posting it on the website. The meeting will start off with a short presentation that goes over the common questions we've been receiving from the community with the majority of the meeting being dedicated to a question and answer segment at the end. For the Q&A segment, we'll use the raise hand feature in Zoom to facilitate comments and questions. During the Q&A period, you may raise your hand feature to speak and we'll ask you to unmute. If you're joining us by phone, <clears throat> please press star nine to raise your hand. And then for all speakers, when your name is called, please unmute your microphone and begin speaking. So we have about 55% participants for tonight and that'll likely go up. And so we, therefore we are limiting the questions to one minute per speaker. Our goal is gonna to be to get everyone to allow them to ask questions. And we've also turned off the camera feature for attendees to make sure the meeting does not have any issues with bandwidth. If time permits at the end of the meeting, we'll allow for additional time to speakers who've already asked questions. However, we are gonna be respectful of everyone's time tonight and we're gonna end the meeting promptly at 8 p.m. So before I get into the agenda, I'd like to allow our Director of Public Works and to say a few words. Good evening, uh, as Christoph said, I'm Ann Stillman. I'm the Director of Public Works. And I wanna thank you all for attending this meeting tonight. And thank you for your interest in the work that we are doing here, evaluating the road standards and whether um, folks are in favor of new road standards or or not um, for this particular area. Um, I have been lucky enough in my career at the county to be able to work on road standards in other areas of the unincorporated areas of the county of San Mateo, which have included the Sequoia Tract area, the Country Club Park area, the North Fair Oaks area, and the West Menlo Park area. I was not involved in um, the process many, many years ago to um, have this a similar discussion regarding road standards for the Menlo Oaks area. Um, we see the results of it and we understand it from the board um, documents and whatnot, but I was not involved in that process in the past. Um, as Christoph said, you know, we have tried to structure this meeting in a way that we can categorize the issues and the things we've been hearing from people. And we can walk through that to try to um, explain things better or further, um, improve everybody's understanding of them. I know I certainly have been um, able to, I've received several emails along with others. Um, I know this is an important topic to many of you. We understand that. And um, also that you live in a very special and unique neighborhood. So, um, I look forward to hearing what Christoph has to say. He's going to work through the presentation. And as he says, we're going to get through it and then uh, work to take questions. And hopefully the presentation will address a lot of the questions um, that you've had that you've either raised to us or that maybe you're talking amongst yourself uh, with. So again, thank you very much. Uh, and we look forward to the presentation. Thanks, Christoph. Thank you, Anne. And before I get into the agenda, I do want to reemphasize the reason for this meeting. We've presented a lot of information during community meeting number one and subsequently received several questions from the community. We've posted all the past meeting materials, developed additional documents and posted them on our project website and then sent out email blasts when new information was posted. Based on the number of questions received, we felt it would be helpful to schedule a follow-up meeting to provide clarifications, address items not covered in the first meeting and then open up the meeting for further questions. I also want to take this opportunity to set the record straight on this process. The county's goal is to provide you with the relevant information needed to make an educated decision. We do not have a preference on which way the community votes. We're here to provide you with our experience performing these types of projects for the last 25 years. We understand the two camps have formed on the issue and encourage and appreciate the dialogue. However, the county should be your source of information and we're happy to answer your questions. While you may not like the answers we provide, we feel like we've been transparent, available, and the Department of Public Works has a history of keeping our commitments. As far as tonight's agenda, as you can see on the screen, we'll start by going over the Ringwood and Coleman study being managed by the Office of Sustainability. 
review and clarify the options you're voting on, revisit the street views and renderings, discuss previous projects that you can visit to see what options would look like, go over the timeline for implementation based on uh, both voting options, go over the frequently asked questions in our responses, and then open it up for further questions. So there's been several questions regarding the Ringwood and Coleman study and how they are related to this process. To reiterate, that, dis that was discussed in the first meeting, and we've decided to remove Ringwood and Coleman from this study for multiple reasons. The County of San Mateo has a separate effort that is occurring for those two roadways that is being led by the Office of Sustainability. Ringwood and Coleman are different from the rest of the roads we are studying and merit their own study. Ringwood and Coleman have been identified in the county's active transportation plan as key areas for multimodal improvements to help support access, safety, equity, modal share, and flexibility in the county's transportation network. They have also received funding from our board of supervisors to further those studies and is a key initiative for the supervisor in the area. Whatever alternative is selected through the Coleman and Ringwood study will be incorporated into the road standards for those two roads. And lastly, there is a virtual community meeting being held for that study tomorrow from 6 to 8 p.m. via Zoom. So uh, we have the information available here, and you can also find it on the Office of Sustainability website. Now I want to clarify and reiterate what voting for maintain as is or no improvement means. I want to make this crystal, crystal clear that voting no to improvements does not mean we will not do any work in the community. We will continue to perform the pothole repairs that we've historically done, and you should expect the same level of pothole repairs that are occurring now. In the addition of the potholes, we'll expand the definition of maintenance for the community. So what this means is that we'll add all the roadways that vote no to our pavement preservation cycle. And as a reminder, the pavement preservation cycle was explained in detail in our first meeting, and that'll include slurry, capes, or microsurfacings. So a best example for you to see this would be the West Menlo Park area, where we recently completed a microsurfacing for roads in a similar condition to what we have in Menlo Oaks. Uh, please note that the asphalt rubberized chip seal that was placed on Berkeley Ave is an option for the pavement preservation. However, it does cost six times more than a typical microsurfacing, and the roadway needs to meet a certain criteria for its use. So that is an uh, option and in our toolbox for pavement preservation. But historically, and our current plan would be to install a microsurfacing treatment when the time comes, which along with the slurry seal is what we place on 99% of our roadways within our pavement preservation program. Again, our current cycle is running 13 to 15 years, meaning once we come into your neighborhood to perform a seal, we will not come back for another 13 to 15 years. We will continue to patch and crack seal in between those 13 and 15 years, but we will not install another slurry slurry until that uh, interval reoccurs. Slurries typically have a lifespan of five to, seven, five to seven years. And so as you can see, the county has much more need than our budget allows for this type of work. Again, this option will maintain the existing width of the road and the drainage patterns will remain the same. We do not install any drainage improvements as part of our pavement preservation program. So that means no valley gutters and no stormwater capture will be installed. Drainage improvements will need to occur separately and are funding dependent. Now let's discuss what happens if you vote yes. We'll continue to perform the same level of maintenance as we do now, as we work towards designing and constructing a roadway. We will also develop a priority list of streets for those streets that vote yes, so that we have a plan to follow. Once a street is up for construction, we'll go out and survey all the current owners on the street and I'll go into detail on what that survey process looks like in a few slides. If the current owners choose to move forward with a project at that time, we'll work to design and construct one street per year based on available funding. Included in the construction will be valley gutters and green infrastructure to help with drainage. We've also been asked to clarify the total widths of the options and prepared this table. So this table shows the different widths as well as all the options available that we presented. So using option wasn't one as an example, let me just put on my laser pointer. Oops, bear with me. Okay, it's not working, but using option one, um, so a 16 foot road with two foot of valley gutters 
means that the total improvements on the area would be 20 feet. So that's the 16 feet of roadway with two feet valley gutters on either side. In addition to the, val the valley gutters need about a foot on each side for the construction and formwork. And so the total construction impact or width is 22 feet. And so as you can see, as the options get wider, the total improvement width gets wider, as well as the total construction area needed. So using option six as an example, if you were to select 20 feet of roadway with three foot wide valley gutters, we would end up installing 26 feet of improvements and we would need 28 feet in order to complete the work. So this shows the remaining roads. So the roads outside of the general area are gonna be Arlington Way, but only the section between Ringwood Ave and the turn. So this is the section that has the existing curb and gutter on the south side. Again, with the two options available, the total improvement for option one would be 24 feet and a total impact or construction zone of 26 feet. And then option two would have a total improvement area of 26 feet and a total impact of 28 feet for the construction area. Frederick Court is already has an existing 22 foot road with two foot road valley gutter. And so we're not proposing any standards there. We're just gonna maintain that area as is. So now let me take some time to explain what a valley gutter looks like and what's the required formwork for construction. The next set of photos show how a valley gutter is built. So you can see from the first photo on the left, the area is excavated to the required depth and then formwork is installed on either ends to contain the concrete using wood. The photo on the right shows the next stage where we install a mesh for some structural strength and also shows how we have the ability to curve around obstructions. In this case, we're curving around a manhole but we can also use this to curve around trees or other obstructions in the roadway. And so please note that the case, in this case, the actual formwork and area needed for the formwork is much less than the foot that I mentioned earlier. However, we do use the one foot as a conservative number because each contractor is different. And so we wanna be conservative with the total impacts. After the formwork is completed, the concrete is poured, formed and smoothed. The photo on the left shows the valley gutter after it was poured and is being smoothed. You can see it's right next to some existing vegetation and how closely we can work around some, some uh, uh, landscaping. And then once the valley gutter is poured, we replace the surrounding area to match what was existing to the greatest extent possible. So we will not reinstall landscaping or pavers, but we do try to put back native dirt or rocks that existed. And so you can see in the photo on the right, this is how the final valley gutter will look like. We'll try to match the existing to the lip of gutter. Another key thing from this photo is there was a question during the um, subsequent to the meeting about the five foot conforms or three to five foot conforms to the driveway. And so this is what that would look like. The conform is the darker area where we would go from where we needed the construction zone to match the grade of the existing driveways. And so typically this is what would be replaced. And as always, we try to, limp try to limit the impacts as much as possible, both for driveways and um, things adjacent to the edge of the valley gutter. And then finally, here's some comparison photos of Encina Avenue, which is the most recent reconstruction project that we did. So these photos are taken on the same day that we had a rain event. And so the photo on the left shows part of Encina that's located within the town of Atherton limits, and they chose not to install valley gutters on the edge of the road. You can see the water ponding on the edges and as I mentioned in our first presentation, it usually takes a few hours to a few days for this to infiltrate, depending on uh, how recent the storm was, uh, the condition of the ground, things like that. And as you can see, the photo on the right shows the same street with completed valley gutters and shows how the water is flowing to the inlets that we've installed here. And so again, these photos were taken on the same day and they're intended to show what valley gutters can do in terms of drainage on the roadway. Now I wanna go over the rendering, renderings that we went over in the first presentation and explain the impacts from various options. For this presentation, we'll only go over one roadway, Madison Way, and the slide shows the current condition of Madison Way at one location, and it's not intended to represent of the entire roadway. We understand that the roadways have different widths and can vary wildly. However, for this example, Madison has an average width of 15 feet it ranges from as narrow as 14 feet, two inches to as wide as 16 feet and has a 60 foot right of way. Now let's say the community selects option one for Madison Way. So that would mean 
we would install 16 feet of roadway, which is indicated by this darker hatching and two feet of valley gutter on either end, which is indicated by some of this lighter gray hatching. And so you can see that the impact would be one foot wider than exists currently, or about six inches on either end of the roadway. And then again, we would add two feet on the edges for the valley gutter, and then another one foot on both sides for the formwork or the construction area. Um, option one can be seen see here. And if you look at the rendering above, the impacts are fairly minimal. So we are affecting the pavers, driveway, and the shoulder area on the left. And then on the right, it looks like we're affecting some of the driveway and shoulder area. In our experience and professional opinion, and based on our work over the last 20 years, the impacts that are shown here are minimal and would not be significant. We have experience with all these on past projects and would be able to resolve them successfully, either through the design or working with the individual property owners. So this option has zero impact on trees, meaning that there's no trees located within the 20 two foot construction zone for this option. So this slide, as you can see, if you go from option one to option two, it starts to get wider. And so basically we're extending the footprint of the area by an additional two feet on either side. So it would be an 18 foot wide roadway, everything else stays the same. Again, the impacts are generally limited to the same things as above. As you can see, we impact the same paver, a little bit more driveway, more shoulder, and then same on the other side. With this option, we do have four trees that we've identified that are within the 24 foot construction zone. And I'll go into details later about tree mitigation. And then finally, as you can see, the last option is another two feet wider and has a total of 26 feet of total construction area that would be needed for this option. So the point of these slides is to help people understand that what we look for when we move forward with design in our experience, all these things that I mentioned earlier, driveways, pavers, shoulders, and even trees are things that we've encountered in the North Fair Oaks and West Menlo Park areas. And we've been able to successfully work around these with property owners, working with our arborists for tree issues and through our detailed design. Again, for this example, I only went over Madison Way, but you can refer back to our presentations for the first community meeting to get a better understanding of your roadway. Um, there are times where there are conflicts we can't avoid. So that's when we would curve around the trees, curve around ob obstacles, things like that. And again, we identify those through detailed designs and work with the individual property owners and make sure we limit impacts as much as possible. So we looked through our files and we wanted to provide you with the following information. Seeing is believing, as they say. So if you're curious to see what a finished project looks like, you can refer to the following locations. So please note that the options above are going to represent either options three or four in our voting process. Historically, we've not built any roads that are comparable to the Menlo Oaks area with options one and two, which are only 16 feet wide. However, based on what we've seen in the field, past communications with Menlo Oaks residents in Moda, we understand the importance of limiting the impacts to trees. And so we've developed the 16 foot road option for this community based on the unique characteristics. All of these samples are located in the North Fair Oaks area, which is just a few miles north of Menlo Oaks. And again, this presentation will be available online for you to refer to after. But if you wanna see what an 18 foot wide road with two foot wide valley gutters looks like, you can go to 9th Avenue between Middlefield Road and Oak or these other roads. And then if you wanna see an 18 foot wide road with three foot wide valley gutter, similarly, you can go to 9th Avenue between Oak Drive and Edison or 10th Avenue from Fair Oaks to the end. And so now let's talk about some drainage considerations. So again, Menlo Oaks does not have an underground storm drain system to collect and convey stormwater. Stormwater generally flows along the roadway shoulders and then many of the road rays are permeable. After a rain event, there's localized ponding on the edges of the roadway and low spots. And because the shoulders are permeable, the water infiltrates into the ground after a few hours to days based on the locations. If you choose no for the standards, we will maintain as is, the existing drain impacts will remain. Even after we come in with our payment preservation slurry work, as I mentioned, we don't include drainage improvements. If you choose one of the six options, we will be required to install valley gutters as well as green infrastructure. So valley gutters are intended to reduce ponding and convey drainage away to another location. And they're also intended to address smaller storms. So something like a two to five year interval storm. 
Um, and so they're not going to fix everything or for all storms. It's like if we had something like we had at the end of last year, the valley gutters will not help. Green infrastructure is something that's a requirement for any of the road options one through six. And it's something that's mandated by the California Water Board. So this means that we'll need to treat stormwater through one or more different available systems. So one that we've used successfully in the past is called a subsurface system or a gallery. And that's what's shown on the left. We can install these in the roadway as long as there's no utility conflicts. Uh, and we can also install these in the shoulder underground um, if there's available room. Another option would be a bioswale that's installed in the shoulder areas, similar to what was installed on the corner of Peninsula and Berkeley. And so these are installed above ground. They take surface water and just sheet flow, and they do remove parking in the shoulder areas. And so you cannot park on the bioswales or on the location that we installed at Berkeley or Peninsula because of the chemicals from the cars, as well as it could potentially damage the drain rock and the systems that we installed underground. Again, all these systems are intended to treat smaller storms and not intended to fix everything. And again, the green infrastructure is one of the main driving forces of needing to include valley gutters because we need a way to convey the water to these localized points where we're able to capture it, store it, and treat it. I also wanted to share a few photos of what green infrastructure can do to the drainage on the roadway. The photo on the left shows Encina Ave at the dead end before our project was installed a few years ago. And the photo on the right shows the same location after our project was installed on January 5th, 2023, and after we had about a third inch of rain, which is a pretty significant event. You can see in the photo on the left, there's ponding on the shoulders, uh, there's ponding in some of the driveways, which I'm sure is what you guys experience in some locations along Menlo Oaks now. And then the photo on the right, if we were able to install valley gutters and the subsurface systems, the, the ponding is eliminated, people have access to their driveways. Now, I won't, do want to be clear, uh, this is just one example <clears throat> and only going to work if we find the subsurface area. Uh, the, there, there may be localized ponding, even with valley gutters, depending on the size of the storm. And so it's not a fix-all for all drainage issues, but it does help. So now I want to take some time to discuss the study process and the next steps. The survey was mailed to you, and you can be downloaded from the project websites. Surveys are due. October 15th, or sorry, December 15th. Uh, and we've already received surveys from property owners. So however, if you decide that you wanna change your vote after this meeting, please contact us. Our contact information will be at the end of this presentation. And we'd be happy to work with individual property owners if they choose to change their votes. We will also respect the privacy of everyone and keep the votes private. Uh, we'll be providing a general response rates per street by the end of the week so that you can see how many surveys have been received by each streets. We'll also do this to make sure that <clears throat> we help get the vote out, as I know there's several groups <clears throat> helping with that. And so the goal with that will be not to provide any names or addresses and only a rough count. So as an example, if there's 50 homes on Menlo Oaks, and as of Friday, we've received 23 surveys, we'll note that in our uh, information. Uh, and similar with all the other streets, so you guys can understand of who, what streets have low or high participation rates. And then in terms of process for voting and results, so the process we're going through now will be on a street by street basis. So you're allowed to have one vote per property for the street you live on. Berkeley Ave will vote for their street, Peninsula Way will vote for their street, and so on. We've made the decision to allow property owners to have a direct say on what happens to the street in front of their own home and not be affected by others who do not live or travel on their specific street. Uh, the roads vary significantly in Menlo Oaks, and therefore we allow, we're allowing the street by street vote to occur. We do not need Board of Supervisors approval for this decision on the vote, as it is an informal process to try to understand what the community wants. We are ultimately gonna take our recommendations for the, to the Board of Supervisors for their review and approval. Finally, there's some corner lots who have multiple, who front multiple roads. So these residents will be allowed to vote once and their vote will be carried over to all of the frontages. So for a home who lives on the corner of Colby Ave and Berkeley, their vote, either a yes or no, will count for both Colby and Berkeley when we go to do our calculations. 
We understand that some folks may want to have different votes based on the streets, and I'll go over how that is covered shortly, and this is specifically for those corner lots. We've received many questions on the voting process and the fact that somebody who abstains or does not submit a vote is counted as a no vote. We base this decision on the common practice in these types of processes and is based on the principle of default or status quo. The rationale behind this approach is rooted in the idea that if individuals do not actively express a preference for change, it is assumed that they are content with the existing state of affairs. Again, our goal is to get 100% participation and we encourage you to speak with your neighbors and encourage them to submit a survey. Based on feedback we received from the first community meeting, if you're, even if you're not in favor of improvements, please fill out your preference in the options presented. We wanna include your opinion if, these should, if road standards should move forward. Again, surveys are due on December 15th, which is a week from this Friday, at which point we'll review the results and start our calculations. Please be patient with us as we have other priorities at the end of the year, and we'll work to perform the calculations as fast as we can. Only county staff will review the survey results and prepare the calculations. Once the calculations are completed, we will schedule a meeting in early 2024 to report out on the survey results. If there are roads that vote to adopt standards, if there are roads that vote to adopt standards, the final road standards and a priority list will be presented to our Board of Supervisors for adoption. In past efforts for road standards, we try to limit the options to the top two to four options that receive the highest number of votes based on their preference for the survey. And only the Board of Supervisors can change the road standards and priority list after it has been adopted. So the effort we're going through today is through funding received from two supervisors. It was split between then Supervisor Don Horsley and current supervisor for this area, Warren Slocum. The department does not have budget to support this type of effort on any reoccurring interval. And so once the process is complete and regardless of the outcome, the department has no plans for resurveying the community on the preference for road standards for the foreseeable future. So now let's go through the process of if road standards are adopted and approved by the Board of Supervisors. Our goal would be to construct one street per year pending funding availability. These projects are extremely expensive and the last one we did was cost north of $1.5 million to construct two blocks. Now let me explain the second round of surveys that would occur in this situation. Once we're ready to start the design of a street, we would look at our priority list and survey the property owners who currently live on the street to ensure they still want a project. Based on how long it takes the department to get to the priority list, we found that the sentiment can change and people move and so on. We've been working on the North Fair Oaks list for about 20 years and I've not even completed it yet. This allows us to understand the current desires of the homeowners and we will work with only the roads that select to adopt a road standard. So for this round of voting, this will be conducted on a block by block basis, meaning that different blocks can select different options that are available to them. Additionally, this is the time where we can perform more detailed design as there is funding source for the work. So we will identify potential conflicts and provide recommendations for avo avoidance or identify the ones that we cannot avoid and then work with the individual property owners on those. We will also spray paint marks in the field so that it's clear the limits of the options available. And then we'll schedule a community meeting with homeowners who live on the street, where we'll provide a presentation similar to what we are doing today. Another item I wanna point out is that we, do not, that we did not cover in the first meeting is the property owners will get to vote for their preferred alternative with one of the options being do nothing or maintain as is. So as always, we compare the options presented or adopted as road standards with the do nothing. Again, we include this option based on the fact that home ownership may change, and we want to make sure that we allow those who live there now to have a choice whether they want a project or not. So in a way, it's like you get a second bite at the apple, and it also ensures we allow people to vote on their, prefer on their preference for a project. Ultimately, based on the results of the survey, we'll move forward with a project, or if for a re some reason vote homeowners vote no to a project, we'll move on to the next street on the priority list. So as far as the timeline for implementation, if you guys move forward with the maintain as is, as part of the roadway in front of your house, the county will include all the streets that voted to maintain as is into our pavement preservation project. Our current work plan shows that four to eight years before we would do a project in Menlo Oaks. 
And the, so that would mean 2028 is the earliest we would come into your neighborhood to do a pavement preservation projects. And at that point, we would include all the roads that voted no. After the 2028 project, the county will not perform another pavement preservation project for 12 to 15 years, as that is our current cycle. And as I mentioned earlier, prior to 2028, we'll still continue to perform potholes and crack ceilings as needed. And we will also continue to do that in between the 12 to 15 year cycle. Similar timeline, if you choose to adopt standards. So we'll work to develop a priority list of streets from those that voted to adopt road standards. Design for the first project would start in 2027 with the construction in 2028. So the same timeline as the payment preservations and surveys to those property, on, property owners would be sent out in 2027. And again, both the payment preservation and the road reconstruction project are subject to funding availability. As I mentioned earlier, the county plans to construct one project per year. So it'll take several years for us to complete the list if multiple roads choose to adopt standard. And again, we'll continue to perform potholes and maintenance prior to us coming out and doing a reconstruction project on your road. So now let me take some time to go over frequently asked questions that we've received to date on the project. As I mentioned earlier, we posted an FAQ on the project website and I encourage everybody to go in and take a look at those. We tried to group the questions into various categories with the first ones being related to the voting process. And so if roads, if the road improvements pass, will there be a follow-up vote on which options for those that had voted for no improvements? If not, it seems unfair for people who voted no, but don't have a voice in which option gets implemented, or would you convert no votes in option one, assuming they'd prefer the narrowest? Again, we ask you to fill out both part A and part B of the survey and part B being a preference on the adopted standards if ultimately your road chooses to move forward those. For those who live on a corner lot, will they input on both streets? Um, as mentioned earlier, they will get one vote, which will carry over to all the streets that the parcel fronts. And then once we move forward with the individual streets, they will be involved in both of those subsequent surveys. Does Peninsula School, School get to take a survey? Yes, all property owners get to vote and their vote will be carried over to all the street, three streets that front the school. So these are questions related to the maintain as is option. Will the current and future potholes and cracks be repaired even if the street widening proposals are voted down? So yes, we wanna make this very clear. We are gonna be continuing to maintain the roads as is. Um, if you choose no for improvements or the maintain as is options, We'll continue to do the pothole repairs. And again, we'll add it to our pavement preservation project where we'll be out likely in 2028 for that work. This one is related to road standards. So regarding option one, will there be 16 feet of roadway and two feet of concrete gutter on each side? So the roadway will be in effect 20 feet. Is the gutter considered traveled portion of the roadway? Our block is narrow to trees and so the distance is we don't have 20 feet and so we discussed the um, widths of the construction options earlier we do not consider the valley gutter as part of the travel way however if two cars are driving opposite directions they can drive into the valley gutter to avoid each other and regarding the narrow sections we'll work to either narrow the street at that location as explained in the first presentation can you compare provide a comparison showing the six options related to the mean or median standards of other communities, as well as the American Society of Civil Engineers recommendations. Um, so we noted some of these questions were received after the FAQ was posted. Um, so we cannot provide this comparison just because we don't have the data available of what other communities have as their minimum option without significant research. There's several different groups that publish recommendations, including um, American Society of Engineers, the Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, and the Institute of Transportation Eng Engineers. They all have different recommendations ranging from 22 to 30 feet and highlighting the need for unimpeded emergency access and parking on each side of the road within the roadway. Um, is it true that re by replacing the road, future crack seals and pothole repairs in the road can be repaired with greater longevity? Yes, a reconstruction roadway is easier to maintain with crack sealing and pothole repairs. Generally, it does not need pothole repairs for several years. And when done, they actually last longer because there's some structural section and base to support the repair. 
can you please let me know what this means? The county says neighbors are still responsible for the non-traveled portion of the roadway. So like it currently exists, anything outside of the improvements that we install our property owner responsibility. So this would be from the edge of the current roadway or edge of the new valley gutter up to your fence line. The motor board is claiming to be negotiating with county to make this project happen. However, motor board does not have the authority to negotiate anything. See the attached bylaws. So MOTA was the lead in securing funding from the supervisors for this effort. The county and MOTA have been in communication on issues within Menlo Oaks for several years, and the county has been transparent with our information and our, our availability to meet and discuss this project with anybody. If standards are adopted and once work begins on any given street, how long will it take to complete? How will homeowners access their driveways? Will there be periods where access is limited? Construction typically takes four to six months and is typically done between April to October each year. Driveway access will be maintained throughout the project construction. However, there may be times when access is limited. <clears throat> so this is when work is occurring right in front of your driveway, and we would try to limit that to four hours per day. The contractor can also work with individual property owners. Is there an example to view of what the striping will be? So the cap, uh, in terms of striping, we'll review and replace what's in kind, and where it makes sense, we may install enhancements. So enhancements may include yellow crosswalks near school, sharrows or share the bike lanes, legends and other hatching to help with intersection movements. We do not have enough room on any of these streets to install bike lanes. And here's some of the um, past examples of what these enhancements would look like. Photo on the top left shows some just turning movement enhancements that help people at intersections. This is a yellow crosswalk for a school. And then this is a typically a sharrow that we would install. Is there another FAQ coming soon? Um, so we'll post this presentation online with the recording of the questions asked here, and then we may update the FAQ um, if additional questions, if it's warranted. Uh, next set of questions related to trees. So will digging up roots of trees be helpful to trees, the potential to decompress the roots, and if appropriate protection is installed, that distributes weight of the future traffic better? Does the county arborist concur? So we talked to the county arborist and he indicated this may be true for some trees, but many factors will be need, need to taken into account and evaluated on a case by case basis. So while it may help to relieve pressure, there's the risk of nicking roots, which would have a negative effect or introducing diseases. And so it's really the county's preferred approach <clears throat> would be to avoid the trees and work around them. And so work with a county arborist to develop a plan for every impacted tree. Is it true that pooling of water neg negatively impacts trees? Is one of the benefits of valley gutter moving water away? Yes, ponding of standing water may be harmful to the root system of trees. Um, valley gutters will minimize ponding by moving it away. But again, we need to make sure to be careful when we install the valley gutter so that we don't damage roots. And it's not as simple. And so again, we'll work with our arborist. Trees, uh, where and why are trees designated for removal? So again, we tried to identify trees that may have an impact and not we don't designate them for removal. We never want to remove trees as part of our work. And so we'll work with an arborist to protect all healthy trees. Uh, can you define the term impacted tree, specifically the interpretation from the first meeting is that it'll have its own mitigation and the county will try to save. So yes, we'll try to save every healthy tree the county will work with an arborist to assess and protect all healthy trees. I do want to point out that um, there may be a situation where the arborist that we set that we hire to take a look at the tree deems the tree unsafe, and we will need to remove it for public safety reasons. <clears throat> However, it's going to be on a case by case basis. Um, and so we'll have a specific report for every potential tree that's impacted. Again, this is a table that was posted online after our meeting to try to identify the impacts to all of our options and all of the roads. Uh, it identifies, so the county has experience working in and around trees as part of a reconstruction project. Over the past 10 years of performing projects of this type, I can't recall a time where we've identified a tree for removal as part of our project, meaning we always try to work to save trees and understand the importance. Um, again, we work with county arborists and have developed several mitigation way, uh, features. We also work with our contractor so they understand the importance of not damaging trees during construction. Next question is related to utilities. How would these options be coordinated with both West Bay and Cal Water? So if their standards are adopted, we'll make sure to notify utility companies and provide them with their priority list and anticipated construction 
years, then we'll work to make sure that they get out there and replace their infrastructure ahead of our project. It doesn't always work out like that. And so if our project goes in, we do have a two year moratorium where work, no work can occur. If a utility has to come in after the fact, we do ask them to slurry seal the entire roadway. Uh, the utilities are in their own process of replacing nearly century old pipes. Uh, but if the project moves forwards, then those get further delayed. Again, we try to work with utilities and our schedules don't always align, but we try to get make sure that they complete their work ahead of ours. Based on our discussion with uh, West Bay, they've already and and Cal Water, they've already replaced their some of their infrastructure in that area, and the remaining is scheduled to be replaced based on their own capital improvement plans and policies. And so we'll work to coordinate as best we can. Uh, question related to sanitary sewer laterals: How can the proposed road improvements conflict? And so we typically require to excavate up to eighteen inches on average. Um, if your sewer lateral is shallow and is in the roadway or shallow below the ground, then a road project may affect your lateral. Unfortunately, there's no way of knowing whether we have any shallow laterals here, but in other areas where reconstruction projects have been performed for the last 20 years, the issue has been infrequent, but each project is unique. Uh, the main is pretty deep in this area based on um, our understanding, but there is a, a, a potential that it may come out shallow from your house and travel shallow all the way up until it gets to the main and then dive down to connect. And we have experienced it, which is why we bring it up. Uh, speed traffic. So this is related to the speed mitigate or the residential speed control program. Uh, there was a sub request submitted, but we did not meet the criteria. Um, as far as I'm aware, the residential speed control program has not changed since it was established in 2004. And then is there any guarantee of traffic controls, speed bumps or traffic circles to be installed when the streets are widened? Uh, no, not as part of this process. We are not gonna be installing any kind of traffic control or speed bumps. There is a separate program, which we provided a link to in the other meeting and I can share here for a request. Uh, drainage questions. So we'll run off increase onto Bay Road because of the gutters or onto Coleman. Have there been any studies or discussion with Menlo Park? Our design intent will always be to capture, treat, and store water in the green infrastructure at various locations. The amount of runoff being diverted to Bay Road and Coleman will be limited and based on the capacity of each street. And we do not develop studies at this point or start discussion with Menlo Park. But if projects move forward, we will make sure to do both. And then if county puts in drainage features like those installed at the corner of Peninsula and Berkeley, can you confirm that parking is not allowed? Yes, uh, if, the, if we have to do bioswales or above ground installations, we will not allow parking in those. Um, cars leak oil and other harmful chemicals that it can affect the performance and also the weight of the car can also compact the drain rock and damage the pipes. All right, so thank you for bearing with me. So this concludes the presentation. So that this time we'll be opening it up for a Q&A. Um, so if you are looking to ask a question, please raise your hand and when we will call on you, uh, when we ask you to unmute, please unmute. And again, please try to limit your questions to one minute. We do have several people. Let me see if I can get the count um, in attendance. And so we want to make sure that we're able to get to everybody that has a question. Uh, if there is time at the end, we will open it up to further questions. So with that, let me switch over to my timer. Can you guys see the timer? No. Not yet. I can see it on your um, on your screen that shows your um, face. Oh. Okay, what about now? Can you guys see the timer now? <clears throat> yes, now we can see it. Great, all right. So uh, we'll go with the, John, do you wanna run the? Okay, the first question is from Jim Burr and um, Please unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. Okay. In regards to trees, there is some distrust, distrust amongst some of the neighbors as to how hard the county will work to avoid removing the trees as identified, you know, as potentially being in danger during any road reconstruction, reconstruction process. Therefore, will the county send out their arborists to make a determination as to which of the trees uh, at risk uh, can or cannot be saved prior 
to the next vote uh, yeah. that the streets would take uh, and not make them wait until the actual reconst a reconstruction process starts. And the next question is, are there any parts of Menlo Oaks and any of the roads in Menlo Oaks that are not amenable to a rubberized slip surrey due to their con current conditions and just would not even have that maintenance available? Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so as part of this process, no, we would not be going out and looking to identify trees. Um, however, if standards are adopted through that subsequent street by street process and survey, we would look to have a arborist go and evaluate the trees and then have that information available for the community. And at that point, they'll also have an option of voting that they do not want improvements based on the information that we provide. As far as your question related to the asphalt rubberized chip seal, um, hard to tell now. It requires further design. The Berkeley example was a one-off. Um, it ended up being a good candidate, but not all of them are candidate, and they do have a significant cost increase. And so it might not be supported by our pavement preservation budget. Um, so typically what we do is try to install microsurfacings. Next. So regard, in regards to the, okay. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll move on. And then if we have room, we can um, circle back. Um, the next question is Steve Rasmussen. Hello. Um, hello. Hello. Yep. Hello. We Good. can hear you. Great. So uh, a couple of uh, questions I have. One is, with the options one through six, I have to ask, was there ever a consideration of, of a seventh option that would have been a street redo, but without the valley gutters? Um, is there a state law that prevents um, new uh, construction to be installed without valley gutters? That was one question. And the second is, it looks as though there are instances that I'm hearing where there is existing parking in front of people's homes that may be uh, eliminated due to some of the um, configurations of say the, the green infrastructure. Um, do you expect that reduction of parking, is it possibly significant or insignificant? insignificant? Thank you very much. Yeah, <clears throat> so to your first question, um, the state mandate for green infrastructure <clears throat> is the reason that we need to install valley gutters or the reason we decided to install valley gutters based on needing to convey the water to a central location where we can put it into an inlet and then divert it into an underground uh, bioretention or to a centralized bioswale that is above ground. There's no, um, you know, state mandates or requirements about installing valley gutters versus not. If we were not to install valley gutters, in all likelihood, we would need to install more bioswales on the edge of the road that would take surface flow, and therefore we would impact significantly more parking. And to your second question, um, we prefer the subsurface systems that I talked about because they do the job of collecting and treating stormwater and do not are, are installed underground as long as we have the space. Um, at this point, we can't say the, the impact for um, uh, parking, but uh, we do expect if we need to install the above ground systems that parking will be impacted and we'll try to cite those in a way that limits the impact of parking. And again, we would always try to do the subsurface galleries, even um, whether it's in the roadway or in the shoulder. So that way we get the, we, we meet the mandate and the requirement from the water board and then limit impacts to shoulder parking areas. Okay, the next question is from Danielle Wood. Hi, um, these are just two quick clarifying questions about language, cause I wanna make sure I understood what was used in your slides. So on the one that says the number of impacted trees on Menlo Oaks, impacted, I think you mean just means that they'll be looked at by the arborist because they're in the zone. It doesn't mean they're gonna be cut down. Um, that's my first question, am I correct in that? 
And the second one is you use the term um, uh, form work and construction area. So the 16 foot version that got two feet of gutters on each side is 20 feet, but then there's an extra two feet. And I just wanna make sure I'm understanding that the extra two feet is just when you're building it, right? That's not a permanent extra two feet. What do you mean by those extra two? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, you are correct in that impacted trees means that it's within the construction footprint. So in option one, there's a, if we were to just offset from the current alignment of the roadway, that tree falls within that 22 foot area on either side of the roadway. Impacted means we would work with an arborist to take a look at the tree and then develop a mitigation plan for that tree. Mitigation will include either curving around it, um, shifting the road if there's an opportunity to do that, things like that. Um, and yes, you are correct in your second question in that the extra one foot on either sides for the construction area, that's gonna be restored to what is existing currently. Um, again, we do not put back landscaping or pavers, but we would put back either asphalt concrete um, or what's existing, which would either be like dirt or rocks. And that is not a permanent impact. That is a temporary impact only during construction. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Ted. Hello, Ted. <laughs> Hi, this is Ann Cortlander. You seem to have given me the the floor here instead of okay. Ted. Is that okay? Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I'll find him. Hey. Okay. Okay. I raised my hand too. So um, talking about tree impact, what is the normal excavation depth for this new road and the gutters? So the roadway has an excavation depth up to 18 inches yes. from the current elevation. Gutters are less. Gutters we excavate, I believe, eight inches, six to eight inches. That's generally how thick the gutters are. So the gutter excavation is, is about six inches in depth, and then the roadway can be up to 18 inches. That's historically what we've done in our structural section. Okay, so um, based on that, the number of impacted trees are not just the trees that are in or close by the road, but also would be the trees that's canopy and therefore their root system runs underneath the road because 18 inches, I mean, most of us who have driven on Menlo Oaks, that roller coaster ride is because those are roots of trees. And in front of my house, there are several trees that are very close to the road, whether it's 16 or 18 inches, but you've only mentioned in, on Peninsula Way, you know, one or two trees. And yet there are trees close by the road all the way along, which would be their root systems would be severely impacted by an 18 inch excavation. So how are you planning to, can you, expand what you consider Probably impact um sure so i mean our what we consider impact is if the tree is located within that 20 foot 24 foot area for option uh sorry 22 foot area for option one which would be the construction zone we understand roots spread laterally but based on talking with our arborist, based on projects that we've done in other areas, we've been successfully able to mitigate and work around roots and install our projects and not have any detrimental impact to trees. You can go take a look at North Fair Oaks. We've completed several projects there that have trees mm -hmm. with canopy as well as roots potentially that expand underneath and near the roadway. And we've been successfully able to complete those projects and not have any impacts to trees. So, okay, Ted. Yes, thank you. I'm unmuted okay. now. Okay, thank so you. So I, I, uh, 
I have a question uh, regarding the uh, statement around uh, whether or not approval from the board is required. So I understand this is the first step in the process and it is non-binding. However, the 1998 resolution uh, allowed the entire neighborhood, the entire community to vote on whether we wanted our road standards upgraded as a community. What is happening right now is we have two issues. Number one, we're doing this on a street by street or even block by block basis and Coleman and Ringwood are excluded from this study. So what is the authority and what is the process that you have followed to actually change what we had agreed as a neighborhood back in 1998? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so the, the resolution in 1998 um, says specifically, give me one sec. Um, so future improvements will consist solely of maintaining the existing roads until such a time as the residents desire a different level of improvement as determined by a property owner survey or other means as approved by this or subsequent Board of Supervisors. So both of these processes have been funded by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, the Coleman and Ringwood study, like I said, is included in the Active Transportation Plan, which is a plan that has been reviewed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors. In that plan, it specifically identified Ringwood and Coleman as areas of concern and for further evaluation Subsequent to the adoption of that plan, the Board of Supervisors then funded the Coleman and Ringwood study that is being led by the Office of Sustainability. And so that is the reason that process is moving forward. Similarly, this process was requested by the community and funded by the supervisors, which again is how the, the means for approval, which is why we're moving forward with um, this vote. So both processes are going through a community process where the input will be taken and then ultimately standards are gonna be adopted or not. Excuse me. Looks like we have a question from Zoe. Okay, hold on. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, so I think speed uh, is a huge concern in our neighborhood, and I know that this is a separate study, but I heard that there's current speed study mitigation study, uh, a current speed mitigation study underway. Um, could you discuss if speed bumps are installed after the study, if they'd be installed on top of the current um, roadway and structurally, if it's better potentially on the new roadway versus our current roads that do that don't have any structural stability. Um, and then other question, just to, <laughs> sorry about the background noise, clarify, um, right now we're just voting on the yes to proceed with um, the potential next survey, which would then, um, we would then get another chance to vote on options. And if we vote a no, then we won't get another chance like you said, in the foreseeable future to do anything. Thank you. Yep. Um, so the, if the, through the speed mitigation or through the residential speed control program, uh, something were approved and installed, I think the process would be a little bit different. Um, we would make sure to design whatever is installed based on the existing conditions. So I think regardless as if, if we were to install it on the current roadway or a future improved roadway, we would work to design it to make sure that it lasts and meets the intent of you know controlling speed. And then your second question, um, yes, I, I think, so this process if is uh, whether the community wants to serve road improvements or not. If you guys vote no, um, there will be no subsequent votes on that street. If you do move forward with the yes vote, um, there will be a subsequent vote once we get to that road. And then you'll have a second opportunity to vote whether you want improvements or not. However, those subsequent votes, uh, the earliest we would do that, like I said, would be 2027. 
and uh, typically one per year. So it'll take several years for us to get through that list. Okay, next question is from Stefan Hun. I mean, thank you. Um, and thanks again for uh, a, a pretty thorough review and then going through the FAQs. Um, I just have a simple question. In, in terms of this process, which you obviously have done in other areas in the county and in, in neighborhoods, probably not unlike ours, what's what after the project is done with road reconstruction, what's been the general feedback? I'm, I'm curious about how the neighbors uh, feel after the project is completed. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do send a survey after the project is done to get an understanding of how we did during the design process as well as construction process and what people think. We looked up that data earlier and I believe of the people that had project, 80% were uh, rated the overall project favorably. Um, John, I know you, you, you looked up that information earlier. Is that right? Am I? Yeah, of, of all the people that returned their um, survey, 83% of them approved of the project. And it's mostly like right, right now, everybody's all confused. So this part usually goes, it's a low score, but then once the final construction, they all approved. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any other raised hand. Uh, I just see Greg. Up. There we go. Never mind. Hi. Hello, Greg. Hi, it's actually Vicki Eckert. Thanks. Um, okay. I want to jump in real quick. First of all, I'm really glad you mentioned the Fair Oaks reference because I actually have seen their roads and their trees and it was great work. So it's good. And I encourage everybody to go take a look. Um, with as you look out, like one of the questions I have is really the storms and they are increasing, obviously, from my standpoint, um, in velocity and extent. And, you know, you you guys obviously deal with roads a lot more than all of us. What's your view of if we get it fixed now, is that going to help us sustain it? Or, um, and how much do you think roads are being degraded with the increased amount of more intense storms and any comments you might have on that? Sure. Um, so the trend we're seeing is the storms are more frequent and more intense. Um, the two most detrimental things to a road are going to be sunlight and water getting into the subbase. And so that's why we try to pothole to stop water from getting underneath the road. Historically, that's been the biggest impact um, in addition to high loads like heavy vehicle usage, which we don't expect in this neighborhood because it's residential, but being able to keep water out of the sub base is one of our number one priorities and able to maintain roadways. Um, and so that's why we come in and make sure to maintain them after we've paved them to preserve our investment. So um, the current condition and this slurry seals will help with that. Um, however, again, those get worn out in five to seven years, and then you're exposed to that same potential for having water enter the sub base. A reconstruction project, typically the intended life is 25 years, and we want to be able to protect our investment. And so we go in and make sure we crack seal, do pothole repairs. The pothole repairs typically last longer and things like that. So ultimately, um, you know, the the road will last longer with a new pavement than with the current condition and doing pavement slurries on top. Okay. Um, our next question is from Mark. Uh, uh, yeah, Mark. thanks for um, for uh, uh, listening to me here. I um, just have a quick question. I have a rather unique perspective because. Uh, I was born uh, at Sequoia Hospital, and I went straight from the hospital to Mental Oaks Drive, where I live right now. So I've been looking at the street literally uh, for about 60 years. I'm 62 now, and I think the street has held up remarkably well uh, over the 62 years that I've been uh, staring at it and driving on it, walking on it, playing on it, bicycling on it, and whatever. 
Question, I think in the survey, it suggested that 14 to 18 trees would be impacted if there was reconstruction. Is it your opinion that if you just continue to patch and surface and repair the road, that the number of trees impacted would be zero? Yes, generally the current maintenance cycle um, includes just patching what's existing. And so that's already been disturbed and the trees are already living with the current conditions, right? So we would not be introducing any kind of risk or additional impacts to the trees if we continue with the maintain as is um, option, which is gonna be the potholing. Even the slurry seal will have <coughs> no impacts to the trees. Um, well, let me take a step back. We do pavement repairs when we do a pavement preservation. So we do go a little bit deeper, but again, we would work to limit any kind of impacts. And then the slurry seal is a treatment on top of the road, which would not um, impact any kind of roots or trees. Okay, our next question, I believe is from Hinda. I don't wanna butcher your name. Sorry if I do. Okay, it's Hinda. Um, I have two questions, one having to do with the width of the road and width of the gutter or the valley um, on Arlington Way from Ringwood to the turn in the bend. My house is right on the bend. Um, I would love the idea of a three foot gutter without making the road way any wider than it is. Um, and there seems to be, since there's 22 feet width right now, why couldn't we make a 19 uh, foot roadway and a three foot gutter and then use up that space? But um, that's one question. Uh, the next question I do have is that- um, you, have have 10, found... you have 10, seven seconds. You may wanna ask again, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we took a look at Arlington. I mean, I think Arlington is unique in that it has different, very different characteristics depending on where you are. We work to maintain the existing width if you're going from Ringwood to the bend and then working to make sure that, you know, it seems like the existing width of the project um, is acceptable to the community. We did ask in our first community meeting for those folks that do live in Arlington, if you feel like another option would be warranted to please let us know and we'd be happy to explore that. Um, I think this is the first we're hearing about it. And so that's why we stuck with the 20 foot option with either the two or three foot wide valley gutter, um, which would basically keep the existing travel way the same and then just add or in, in include drainage infrastructure on the side that does not have it. Okay, our next question is from John. Hello, John. I, well, I was unmuting. Okay. Um, hey, thank you. Uh, I went out and looked during the rain at the local streets that have valley gutters and the ones that don't. Um, I went on Berkeley and Menlo Oaks, and then I went to the nearest streets, which were Bay and Edge, and uh, actually half a peninsula is a valley gutter, and it looked like there was more water pooling where there were valley gutters. Now, what you are installing may be different, but can you comment on the fact that the local streets that have valley gutters don't seem to be eliminating pooling. Yeah, uh, so, so through our design, what we try to do is design the valley gutters so that they take water and convey it to specific points where we'll have green infrastructure installed. And so we do that with a combination of things. We're not going to have all the valley gutters flowing in the same direction. Basically, what we do is we try to identify various low points along the road where we would put an inlet and then we would design the valley gutters to flow toward that low point. So they're, they're in, in, on Encina is an example where um, we have valley gutters with a reverse slope. So um, let's use Menlo Oaks for an example. We would have, you know, if we installed a, a green infrastructure system, kind of mid block, half of the block, the, the entire block would be kind of draining generally to that low point. And so some of the flow would be flowing to bay, 
some of the flow would be flowing the other direction to hit that low point. And then we work to make sure that we size those green infrastructures to accommodate the flow. And that's historically how we've been able to reduce the ponding um, and, and uh, rain issues like that. Okay, our, my, our next question is from Antonia, I believe. Hello? Hello, um, I have more questions about the number of trees impacted. Um, specifically about the timing of any long-term assessment of impacts and any um, reassurances that are given about uh, trying to uh, protect the trees, specifically root damage under a drip line, if there's trenching or deep digging, will take years to show up as um, disease or death or damage to the trees. And um, it just strikes me that I don't think public works follows um, what happens to the trees on these streets for decades afterwards uh, under different climate conditions. I'd make the same comment also about satisfaction surveys that um, if the trees are impacted but it takes a decade or more for that to happen, um, it would never be attributed to the road work. So uh, you will, I believe you alluded to um, trying to mitigate damage to roots. Can you speak to that? Sure. Um, so you're correct. We do not track the health of trees, you know, after a project is completed. However, we have been doing road reconstruction projects since the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, North Fair Oaks is an example where we've done multiple projects over multiple years. And so we can work to provide you the years when those were built. If you're curious and taking a look at what that street looks like. Um, and so uh, to your other point about roots and mitigation, again, we, we understand trees and, and preserving trees is a high priority, not only in this neighborhood, but everywhere um, for multiple reasons. And so we work with an arborist, like I said, we'll, we'll literally have a report developed for every single tree that we think may be impacted by our project. We've also have certain things that we put into our project plans and specifications to ensure that we limit or mitigate any kind of impacts to trees. So that includes um, means and methods of how a contractor needs to work around roots. Um, you know, we have information on what happens if a root gets nicked and what they need to do to, to kind of, you know, address it immediately. Um, at times we make, we bring arborists out during the construction and then they provide guidance to us on how we can work around tree roots or treats. So that's typically what we do. Um, okay, our next question is from David. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm relatively new here, so apologies if you covered this in the last meeting. Two quick questions. Um, one, can you talk about what the benefits, pros and cons of two foot versus three foot valley gutters is? And then uh, with respect to Menlo Oaks Drive, is that vote happening for the entire street from uh, you know, above and below um, Coleman, or does it happen kind of section by section? Thank you. Oh, and thanks for the good work here, thank you. Yeah. yeah, the biggest difference between a two foot and three foot wide valley gutter is just the three foot wide valley gutters convey more water and have the ability to hold or retain more water. So if there's certain roads that you have or that you feel like there's significant ponding issues or they get a lot of um, maybe water from the adjacent roads, uh, the three foot road, the three foot valley gutter would be a better option as it's able to convey more water. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? John can either remind me or un... That was, um, do you remember the person that was speaking? Sorry. Okay, do you wanna to go to the next question? And yeah, hopefully sorry. If you can, time. if you can okay. throw your 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 question in the chat, I'll try to I'll try to hit it again. Sorry. Um. Okay. Uh, Nancy, 
And after Nancy, um, John, another John, he has problems. So I'm going to admit him next. Nancy. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Um, speaking as someone who has multiple large trees very close to the street, but on my property, and also someone who has recently supervised a large construction project in which many problems came up after the contractors were gone and they weren't identified early, should one's tree die because of damage done from this, who is going to have to pay for the removal of a large tree, given how incredibly expensive that process can be? So the trees are the responsibility of the adjacent property owners. Um, all the property owners basically own um, everything under the roadway up until up, up until the property line or center of the roadway. And so trees both within your yards and outside on the shoulders are property owner responsibility. If we identify a tree um, during our design that needs to be removed, we would we would do that through our project, but subsequent to that, it would be a property owner responsibility. Okay, our next question is from John. He was having problems raising his hand, so I'm... Hello, John? Hello, uh, John? Yeah, hey, I already asked the question, but I'd love, I, I did unmute, but I have one other question if I may ask it. Oh, um, sure. Um, if we vote for 16 plus two foot gutters making 20, what happens at the portions of the road where it's currently 22 or 23? So if the option you vote for is less than the current width of the roadway, we would remove that and then restore it with uh, native dirt. So it would ultimately make a narrower roadway in those locations. Okay. Our next question is from um, Brent. Hello, Brent. Thank you, guys. I know that there's been a lot of conversations around trees and trees in private yards and other trees in the roadway. Um, I, As part of this project, we quickly talked to West Bay Sanitary. They're under their point-to-point -point program because the sewer lines within Menlo Oaks have failed. And um, they did a recent repair and they cut a three foot wide um, by almost the length of one of the roads down eight feet deep. Um, do you know what kind of impact that would have on the trees in the neighborhood? Because I think you guys are only talking about eight inches to 18 inches, but that trench went down, you know, seven to eight feet. Yeah, again, um... We we do sewer projects as well, not necessarily in this area, but we do maintain and operate 10 sewer and sanitation districts. Um, you know, there there are times when you need to cut roots, you need to do things, and, and we have mitigation and recommendations from arborists, from best practices that in a scenario when you need to cut a root, that you do it in a way that prevents as much potential impact to a tree. Um, again, it's on a case-by-case -case basis and depends on the size, but we do have certain uh, guidance that we put into our specs um, that we try to follow. And then as always, we if, if we see a situation that's unique, um, we'll work with an arborist to understand what we can do to avoid any kind of potential damage to the tree. Okay, our next question is from Jim. Hello, Jim. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. I wanted to go back to my earlier question about the timeline for the arborist to determine of those trees that have been determined to be at risk during any reconstruction process. Um, after this current survey, if we get to a point where there is then a street by street survey down the line, um, will the arborist then make a actual determination that all the trees theoretically that potentially he would say this is not healthy enough or these all all these trees are totally fine and we won't have to remove anything or we have to remove all of them 
will that determination be made prior to the the residents on that street taking their their next vote to say yes i want to move ahead with anything or no i want to leave things as is is that a correct am i correct on that yes yes um as part of our preparation to come to the community or it's not the community but the specific street for them to decide whether they want to move forward with those standards at that time we would work with an arborist and develop a a report based on all of the potential impacts to trees and then we would present out on that report at that community meeting so that you guys can make an educated decision at that time we would work to identify what we can do to mitigate by either curving around trees narrowing the roadway and then if there are certain trees that we could not we would identify those and say you know unfortunately we're not able to do anything here these trees have a potential to be removed um, so at, we would do that before the vote is uh, due. Okay. Our next question is from Victoria. Hello, yeah, Victoria. Hi. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much. Um, I so I live on Menlo Oaks Drive, and um, my question is around the bumps and the you know kind of the potholes and everything that are existing. Um, my mother, my older mother stayed with me during COVID for a long time, and she actually fell and was pretty badly injured on her legs. Uh, one of our other neighbors, I know his father fell and broke a hip and my kids, you know, it was impossible for them to practice roller skating or skateboarding or anything when they were younger. And I had to take them down to different streets, um, kind of on the other side of Bay road. So I guess my question is um, around the safety of the current roads and whether there's any concern sort of at a supervisor level with ADA compliance, because I'm pretty sure it'd be virtually impossible to do use a walker or a wheelchair on these roads. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of roads, I mean, um, <clears throat> there is no technical ADA requirement for the condition. Um, you know, that's more related to path of travel on an improved sidewalk, things like that. And so, um, unfortunately, you know, the county maintains 320 or 316 miles, 620 centerline miles of roadways. And so there's no way we would be able to meet that kind of ADA requirement. Um, again, the slurry seal has the ability to smoothen the roads to a degree, but it's typically not thicker than a quarter. And so you can imagine those kind of voids that it would fill. Um, and so it will help, um, you know, we will look to fix the really bad areas prior to going out there and slurry sealing. And so that process will work. And then a reconstruction would be a completely new um, paved asphalt roadway, which would be smooth um, and would be more conducive to the things you said. I think regardless of which option moves forward, um, both improvements will help with that issue, um, but uh, the reconstruction is, you know, hands on the, above the, the better option for that type of um, use. Okay. Okay. Our next question is from Sal. Let's see. Hi. Hi. Thank you, uh, guys. A uh, quick question. I know each street is different, uh, but one thing we've noticed, at least on Ringwood, uh, during the rains, et cetera, you know, um, there can be a pretty big river that essentially flows down, that essentially makes walking, biking, et cetera, you know, almost impossible on, on Ringwood. So I think you you may have addressed this. I think one question would be that when you're going to be putting all these gutters, et cetera, you know, what is the chances that we may end up with something similar where instead of the water kind of draining into the natural ways it does in a couple of days, you know, would be possibly end up with situations where we may actually have more flooding or more streaming down the streets like we have on Ringwood. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I mean, our intent is always never to increase or exacerbate the flooding or drainage issues. We would uh, work to, so typically what we do during a design is we identify the watershed area to get an understanding of how much water is contributed. Uh, we take a look at the pervious area versus the impervious area and what contributes to the shoulder ponding, which is typically the roadway. We then work to design valley gutters to convey that to a central location. I think if um, over the next couple 
days. I mean, it's raining today. It's likely going to be raining maybe in the next couple of days. I encourage you guys to go take a look on Encina Avenue in North Fair Oaks, where we've recently completed a project where we were able to mitigate all the flooding and issues. We've historically done similar projects in um, that area that have helped with flooding and ponding and things like that. And we've been successful in being able to design um, it in a way. I do want to be clear that it's, it's not going to fix every single storm. Um, there are going to be larger storms that will flood regardless. It'll it'll flood in the current condition. It'll flood with valley gutters. It's just there's only so much capacity and so uh, such a large storm that we can treat with the valley gutters and green infrastructure. Okay, our next question is from Hinda. Um, Hinda, you have to unmute. I'm worried about the gutter because I'm worried about having to step over the gutter to get onto my get into my house if I'm out walking. And is there any mitigation for that so that I could designate a part of the thing that would represent a walkway for me so I don't have to go into the valley and up? That's one of the reasons I was interested in the three foot valley, but I don't think that's going to be voted for in any way. One, two, can we have a meeting with the landscape, uh, the tree arborist person when making a decision on a block by block basis? Or is, are you going to be the interface between the arborist and those of us who are making those decisions? Yeah, so generally the valley gutters, I mean, they're two feet wide um, and the difference in elevation between the edges and the bottom is like four to six inches. So it's very easy to step over. So I don't think that'll be an issue. Again, I, I, I would encourage you to go take a look at any of the sites that we mentioned earlier with the two and three foot wide valley gutters. We install them in front of all the driveways and there's no way to really stop that because then it would impede or, or stop the flow and, and not work as we had designed. Uh, when we go on a street by street basis, um, we will have a report developed and that'll be part of the project file that we would we can share with you. I mean, historically, we have not included the arborist. Um, in the public meeting, we just take what he provides in, in his or her report and report out on it. And it's not always the county arborists. Um, they're not always available. And so we do have a um, suite of consultants that we use to provide this service for us as well. Okay. Our next question is from Stephen. Hi, this is just a, a kind of a road technical question. Um, I've always been struck by the similarity in the irregularity of the road uh, surfaces within almost entirely Menlo Oaks with a few street exceptions. Is that because the roads in Menlo Oaks generally don't have a sufficient or any base? Is that part of what the underlying issue is within the road conditions here in Menlo Oaks? Thanks. Yeah, we haven't done research on every single road, but our understanding is there is no structural base as part of the roads, the majority of the roads, with the exception of probably Coleman and Ringwood in the area. Historically, what we've seen in situations like that is it starts, it's, they're put in either by the developers um, when the communities are, are um, constructed or it starts off as like a gravel road, like in the 1900s. And then people just basically, the way they used to build road was just to put oil on top of them and then throw rocks. And then historically, that's what we've been built off of. And then at some point, somebody comes in and may do a paving project. And so it's hard to tell exactly um, what is under there without digging it up. Um, and the reason it varies is just, uh, you know, the roads were built in different times, different means, different methods. And so that's typically the very, the reason for the variation. Okay, our next question is from Dennis. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so if we vote to adopt a new standard and put in gutters, who is responsible for maintaining the gutters, for cleaning them out, for keeping them clear? Uh, because with all the trees in the neighborhood, they're just going to get covered up in leaves and effectively be ineffective 
pretty darn quick. Thanks. Yeah, so um, our road crew is typically responsible for maintaining drainage infrastructure that we've installed. Um, so they would be looking at the drainage inlets and making sure that those are cleared and not clogged. Um, they have periodic patrols ahead of storms to make sure that infrastructure is going to be working as intended. Um, I don't want to, uh, it's not my department, so I don't know if they go in and would do street sweeping on this roadway um, if it was constructed, but um, maybe Anne or, or Wednesday, I don't know if you guys are familiar kind of with roads um, maintenance related to this. Right, this is Anne. I mean, we do have our street sweep sweeping schedule posted to our website. I was just looking at that right now. And um, typically the streets can be swept. Um, always easier if there's a curb line or something to sweep against it. Um, and typically right now, I think in the Menlo Oaks area, the only road that I see that we're sweeping is Ringwood. And it probably has to do with the fact that we don't have kind of that hard surface with a valley gutter on the outside edges of that. Okay, our next question is from Francesca. Hello? Hey, you Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. we can kind of hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to know, first of all, thanks for your work. Uh, very detailed. Um, what can you tell us about um, road speeds um, on Menlo Oaks or on Berkeley and what the impact might be on speeds. Because from what I understood from what you said, any speed mitigation is decoupled from this process entirely. Um, and uh, related to speeds as well, like is it a, a wider street means faster speeds or like how, what's the interaction piece? Yeah, um, so we don't have specific information on Menlo Oaks, but anecdotally, um, if roads are improved, the expectation is that, and widened, the expectation is that people will feel more comfortable driving faster. Um, having said that, I think it varies on where you are, and generally people in a residential area um, try to drive slower. I understand that the issue in Menlo Oaks is the kind of episodic speeding from the local schools, um, but anecdotally, yes, I would, I would imagine that speeding or um, cars would feel more comfortable driving faster on a road that's been improved as opposed to the current condition for multiple reasons. Okay, our next question is from Antonio. Hello. Hello, um, I have a question. You alluded to the fact that um, there were road improvements done in Atherton and they elected not to have valley gutters put alongside those road improvements. Um, why could road improvements without the valley gutters be an option for Menlo Oaks? Uh, certainly not having valley gutters has not impacted their property values negatively. Yeah, so Atherton elected not to have valley gutters installed because we were able to design um, the roadway to be able to convey and treat the storm water in our side of the road. Um, and so um, the, re the reason we need Valley, we need to install green infrastructure whenever we do a project of this scale and that's just a state mandate. And in order to do that, I mean, we don't have to install Valley gutters, but then we would need to install bioswales basically along the entire edge of the roadway or the majority of the roadway. And so we weigh, weighed the pros and cons of the various options and chose to install Valley gutters and try to work to install the subsurface galleries, therefore limiting impacts to shoulders and more impacts to the community. Okay. Okay. Our next question is from Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Thank you, guys. Can you just uh, clarify for me? There seem to be some confusions, at least on my end, in reading the comments regarding Menlo Oaks Drive. Uh, Menlo Oaks Drive is either three blocks long or five blocks long, depending upon how you want to count a block. Is the entire street voting as one entity, or will the votes be divided 
per block. Yep, it is per street. So all per street. Per street. Correct. So it's not on a block by block basis during this round of voting. And so we will take a look at all of the survey that results that we get along the entirety of Menlo Oaks, and that will determine if road standards move forward or not. However, if road standards were to move forward, that subsequent vote when Menlo Oaks is up for reconstruction will be conducted on a block by block basis. Okay, our next question, I don't want to try their name because I'll probably butcher it. Hello? Hi, it's Ozaday. Okay. Uh, quick question. We're ready to make our vote. Um, we've downloaded the survey from the website, but it's not clear exactly where we should send it. If you could send, put the address in the chat, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, yep, I think on the um, presentation, my name is on the presentation and um, you can email me. Oh, sorry. I muted you, Krista. No problem. Uh, and we'll we'll put the address in the chat as well. Uh, next question is from John. Hello, uh, John. Yeah, hi. I, I noticed today that there's a storm sewer at the corner of Bay and Menlo Oaks. Um, would that be available um, in the construction? Mm, what do you mean by available? Storm. Hello, John. You can. He, uh, sorry, he may I'm mean. He you. may mean. Can you leverage that or tie into that, which is part of a Menlo Park system? I just uh, hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um. Hey, John. Hello, John. You can unmute yourself. I hope. Uh, hi. Yeah, are, are you you're, so yeah. you're talking about a drainage inlet that's on uh, Bay Road that's um, potentially a Menlo Park system? I, I wouldn't know, but I accept that it's a Menlo Park system. It, it it sits on the corner of it's actually in on Menlo Oaks a little bit at the corner of of Bay and it says do not dump flows to Bay. Yeah, yeah, we would work. We would coordinate with um, all of the local um, jurisdictions and make sure that we coordinate the improvements so that. Um, if there's an opportunity to tie into that system that we do so, we also want to make sure to work with them so that we understand what their capacity of that system is so we're not inundating it or sending more water than it can handle. So yes, if there's an opportunity to tie into existing systems on Bay or the adjacent streets, um, we would take that opportunity um, with the approval of the city or jurisdiction. Okay, our next question is from Jeff. Hello, Jeff. Hi. Hi. First of all, thanks very much for doing this. And thanks especially for your patience with these questions. I just want to clarify again, the vote today by street is yes, please keep investigating versus no. And it basically gets dropped till the indefinite future. But if we vote yes, there's an opportunity block by block to vote additionally including no again with more information at hand because the group will have done more surveying and investigation and detail work. Is that right? That is correct. Right, but I want to be clear though too, we're trying to work through this process now so that we can understand whether there's a desire to adopt road standards like we've laid out or not. So that's sort of the first step and, and if there was a desire and um, we took that to the board of board of supervisors and the recommendations would be to adopt the particular standards per road. And we would also accompany with a priority list. If the board of supervisors adopted that, then I think as Christoph explained, we would be going sort of road by road. So first road on the priority list, then we would be surveying people again. That would be block by block. And that would be one more opportunity for people to say, actually, I don't want road improvements or yes, I do. And this is what I want. So I just want to be clear on process. Okay. Okay. Um, I believe Jeff had more to add. Hello, Jeff. Um, thank you. Yeah, just to be clear, although you just phrased it as a vote yes is a yes for upgrading road standards. In a way, a vote yes is yes to more information, and we will be able to vote again in the future. 
Is that correct? Well, when you say to more information, a vote, yes, or yes, I want road improvements. This is how I rank the options is going to help us understand what people are looking at on a street by street basis. That yeah. would be how we would formulate. We would analyze the data and formulate our recommendations to take to the board of supervisors for their consideration. If they approved what we were recommending in terms of standards per road, and a priority list, then we would work towards implementing the standards on a street by street basis. But when we do that, we do things like we survey everybody and we mark out on the ground, essentially where the options would fall on the ground. So people at that point have more information, yes, uh, because they can physically see it. They have another opportunity to say, well, you know, I've thought differently about it or whatever, and express what their vo votes or desires are at that time. Okay, so it's more information. And also, I think earlier you said that it's, you know, as long as 2027 before we're really getting to that. So, so A, it's more information, and B, it's some number of years down the road before we're really looking at that next sort of definitive vote block by block. Is that correct? Yes, that's the way I would look at it. Because, I mean, Part of it is we have to we have to understand what is the desire, what is the will, what are people looking, what do people want, right? Um, but we also have to look at a budgeting perspective. I've seen a lot of the, um, you know, the chat. I haven't, you know, tried to read them as they're coming in and listen listening to Kristoff. Um, but somebody was asking, you know, how expensive are road projects? A road reconstruction project is very expensive. So, um, you know, as Kristoff said, we would be looking road by road. So you have to understand that it takes time to budget for it and design it and build it. And like we've talked about all the details of your neighborhood and all of the things that we're working with and around, you can also imagine um, what goes into a design. It's a lot <laughs> because we want to, if the desire is to implement road improvements, we want to do it in a careful, respectful um manner and it takes time to work through all that too um i also wanted to state though i thank you wency you put the um address our address in the chat that's great we want the hard copies returned to us so just want to clarify that some of the other questions and things i've seen in the chat is talking about you know uh we pay property taxes and i mean the your what you pay for your property taxes just does not go towards maintaining the roads. We have 316 miles of roads in the county that we're responsible for maintaining. We do not get property tax revenue for that work. That's based on gas tax revenue pred predominantly. So I just kind of want to put that out there. Um, I see people sort of talking about speeds and what might happen and what the county is saying. I mean, you could probably imagine that when we talk about road improvements, people um, often are concerned that if you have a smoother road, then that means people will drive faster. I mean, is that true in all cases? Um, I don't think I can say that with all certainty. So, you know, and, and part of it depends on the the external features that are out there. I mean, in, in your neighborhoods, there, there are trees. Like we've just, we spend a lot of time talking about trees. You have to, like for me, part of the experience as a driver is what these visual cues are to you to help you think about and understand how you're going to drive through a neighborhood. I mean, we understand, as Christoph said, you know, we understand clearly the the jurisdictional boundaries that are out there, the schools that are there, and how those sorts of um, situations influence what you you know people experience in in their particular um, neighborhood. So I don't know. I just those are some of the things that I see in there that I feel like I, in the chat that I want to make sure that we're clarifying. And I'm also looking, it looks like maybe we, I think we might have at least one more hand up. I know some people have said, let people that haven't talked or asked a question, give a, give them an opportunity first. I see we've got about 11 minutes left. So I just want to make that call. If there's anybody that feels they haven't been heard, but put up your hand now. Um, I know Ted, you have your hand up, but I know there are other, I know you've already Asked a question, so I'm just putting it out there. If anybody else has a question, do we want to get to the chat questions, or we'll do that after um, this meeting and we can respond and post it again on the web afterwards? Yeah, well, and I would also encourage people 
to, um, I know it's a lot to read, but um, our team here, you know, Christoph, Wensi, and John have received a lot of questions and um, a lot of emails and have worked hard to put this information together in an FAQ, which is many pages long. <laughs> but part of it is to really it's to address the questions that people have and to try to answer them and have one place where people can go and take a look, um, see their question or see a similar question um, or something they have in their mind and then see what the response is. I'm not sure whether um, I, there may be many questions in the chat that we already have included in our FAQ. I think if there are new questions, we can take a look at, um, at adding them, but um, I, th I think we're hoping that many of the FAQ questions and responses are addressing uh, many of the issues and questions that people have. Um, our next question is from Ted. Uh, yes, thank you. I just want to ask a clarifying question based on the previous uh, thread around decisions and timing. So I just thought I'm, I'm clear. You're not saying that we go through this process now. Let's just assume construction starts in 2027. And let's say in 2026, we say, you know what? Forget it. We changed our mind. And at that point, the construction stops, correct? At some point, the process is binding. Yes. It, we, okay. would never, we would never go to a construction without getting a yes vote. So what we would do is when we resurvey it, on a street by street basis, that is the point in time where we either move forward or not. And we would send out a subsequent survey based on the results of that survey that would let us know whether there's a project that needs to move forward. So we won't even start design until we get an indication from the current homeowners, whether they want a project. Once we get that go ahead, it's gonna take us about six months to design the project and then another four to six months to construct the project. So um, in all likelihood, it'll take from the time somebody were to vote, yes, we want a project to do a reconstruction. It will take eight to 12 months for that project to be completed. Okay, our next question is from um, Nick. Hello, Nick. Hey there, thank you. Um, on the question of, of speed, um, and some of this is in the chat, but it, it sounds like there's also a parallel consideration of speed mitigations, both with respect to potentially looking at the speed limit in the neighborhood, as well as um, potentially speed bumps. Can you speak to how that process kind of intersects with the improvement work? Yeah, so the process is not parallel in that it's not part of this process. It's an independent process that's already established. So we have a residential speed control program where you can submit an application for our traffic division to take a look at the road to see if speed mitigation measures are warranted. And then a uh, speed setting speed limits has its own requirements. Um, I think it's pretty rare that we do speed surveys or anything like that in a residential neighborhood. Um, and I believe all the roads are kind of, I think maybe with the exception of Ringwood and Coleman already at 25 miles an hour. Um, and so again, that would be independent from this process. We have a traffic engineering unit that has a licensed traffic engineer that would um, look into that process. Okay, um, we have one more question from Sal. Hello, Sal. Uh, hi, a quick question. Um, but I think just one clarification on this notion of, you know, both street by street in the future can be block by block. But based on at least what I understood was that things like gutters, you can't do that block by block, right? In the sense, if you're going to do gutters, they have to run the entire street. Like you can't do one block having gutters, another one not having gutters. Then after that, it picks up again. So that would be at least my question in sense that when you mean block by block, like is does that mean then the options would change or something else would be different? Yeah, I mean, we would take a, a, a look at what we would basically design a, I'll say mini project on a block by block basis. So if for one, for instance, one block 
chooses to move forward with the project and another doesn't, we would consider that block a mini project and work to contain and design the valley gutters so that all of the water is kept within that block. Um, and then that way we would not be sending additional water to other blocks. And then that's how we would kind of accommodate um, the block by block valley gutter issue. Um, in the chat, I've been putting it in Microsoft Word and we have over 10 pages already. So I don't think we're going to get through it tonight. Yeah, I think we have about five minutes left. Um, so I will let me share the presentation again so that you guys can get a um, can you guys see my presentation again? Yes. Yes. So this is our contact information. Again, um, thank you all for those that attended. Um, we appreciate your engagement and your feedback and your questions. Hopefully this was informative. Um, to reiterate, we did, we have received survey responses to date. If you feel like you wanna change your vote based on what you heard during today's meeting, please contact John or Wensi. Their contact information is here and we will work with individual property owners to get that to happen. Project website is gonna be your best source of information related to this effort. We are gonna be posting this recording. We are also going to post the presentation. So if you wanna to refer to that to take a look at some of the examples we discussed, that'll be available for you. And as always, we have a subscribe for email updates that you can either click on this link when we post the presentation online, or if you go on the project website, it has its own little button. Whenever anything new is posted on the website, that we will send out an email blast letting people know. Uh, again, I want to reiterate or uh, reemphasize that once these surveys are due, please be patient with us as we work to review the survey results and develop the calculations. That's gonna be done solely by county staff. And then our goal is to report out at the next community meeting, which we believe will be scheduled around the end of January, early February timeframe. Um, we'll make sure to include, send out notifications ahead of time. And the goal of that meeting will be a report out and um, discussion of next steps in the process. So with that, um, thank you all. Um, appreciate you being here and um, bearing with me as I spoke all night. Uh, if, if you have any further questions, comments, please give us a call or an email. And um, with that, I will move to end the meeting and Thanks. everybody Christoph. have a Sorry, can I just say, though, I think you mentioned already the recording of this will be posted on the website as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's one. I saw that in the questions in the chat, some people were th had said, because maybe they didn't see the presentation from the last meeting or hadn't gone to see the slides that are also posted on the website, but I think they had asked about the renderings for the different streets <laughs> because Christoph went through every street last time. We didn't do that in this or in this uh, meeting tonight. So with the website, you can go there. You can take a look and flip through um, all those pages. Also, I've seen people concerned with vacant homes or whatever. The surveys have been sent to the property owners of record. It's not the CITUS address. It's the mailing address. Um, so just to make sure that everybody's aware of that, it's the property owner's address that we've sent to. We definitely hope to see a lot of participation. Um, so we'll see how the results go, but we're we're hoping that, you know, people seem very interested in this project. So I certainly hope that people take the time to um, fill out the surveys and I just thanks so much for everybody attending. Okay, back to you, Christoph. Perfect way to end it, Anne. Thank you all. Have a great night. Um, we will okay. likely see you all again in early 2024. Okay. <laughs> And with that, thank you, everyone. I'll, and with that, I'll stop the recording.